to hold on to the bottles, don't take any Tylenol. Linked with five deaths in Chicago. Do not take Tylenol until further notice. They called 93,000 bottles. Ordered store owners to clear their shelves. If it were me, I wouldn't take them. We'd like them to get it out of their home. It's not right. It's not right at all. She was just murdered. Today, we're going to be talking about the Tylenol murders. If you haven't heard of the Tylenol murders, it was a crime that pretty much shook up the states in the 80s. It initially started out as a medical mystery. Several people were being admitted into the hospital. They were collapsing and they were shortly passing away from very unusual symptoms. Doctors thought that these people must have been having a heart attack or even a stroke. But this soon turned from an investigation to not what was causing this illness, but to who was causing it. And the entire nation kind of just shut down in fear because of this. Parents were terrified to let their children trick-or-treat because they thought this thing would happen to them. And several cities in the country actually fully canceled Halloween because of it. What's wild is that there's still so many questions on what exactly happened in this case. But what is known is that this case was behind what's considered the first major product recall in the United States. And it's the reason a lot of medications we buy today are created the way they are. Just to introduce myself, my name is Petal Palmer and on this channel I post anything medical, mysteries, and crime. If that sounds interesting to you, please consider subscribing if you end up liking this video. Alright, let's get into this case. On October 1st, 1982, a woman was found dead in her high-rise apartment located in Chicago, Illinois. Just two days before this, on September 29th, this woman was last captured on security camera making a purchase at a local Walgreens. This woman was named Paula Prince and her death was actually not a shock to investigators because Paula was actually the seventh and final victim of a heinous crime that spanned the entirety of the day. And these cases started with a very young girl who was the unfortunate first victim of this crime. Her name was Mary Ann Kellerman, and she was only 12 years old. Mary was born on March 9th, 1970 in Illinois, the only child to parents Dennis and Gianna Kellerman. She lived in Elk Grove Village of Chicago. And like many her age, Mary had many interests in several different things. Mary loved animals. She had three dogs, a goldfish, and she even had a pony. So horseback riding was actually an activity she would participate in often. And Mary was also very involved in her community. During that seventh grade year, she had started babysitting little kids in the area. So a normal weekday would presumably consist of going to school in the morning and babysitting neighborhood kids in the afternoon. But on the morning of September 29th, Mary had woken up and because it was a Wednesday, she would have needed to start getting ready for school. But this morning in particular, she had actually woken up with a sore throat and a runny nose. So she started thinking, okay, I'm feeling pretty sick. Let me go tell mom and dad and she got out of her bed and headed to her parents room. Her mother Gianna was actually not home at this time. She had an early shift working at United Airlines so when Mary went into the room she was met with her dad Dennis and she asked if she would be able to stay home from school and hoped he could maybe give her something that would help her feel better and fortunately he did have something because just the other evening Gianna purchased a 50 count bottle of extra strength Tylenol from the local Jewel food store. So her dad gave her one capsule and she left his room. Just a few moments went by when Mary headed into the bathroom and Dennis started hearing her coughing very loudly before he shortly heard a loud thud. He obviously was concerned with how she was doing so he called out to her and asked if she was okay but it was when she didn't respond when he decided to leave the room and head towards the bathroom to see if everything was okay. So he headed down the hallway, got right up to the bathroom door and he again asked her, Mary are you okay? But this is where things started getting strange because he would wait a few moments for a response but Mary wouldn't reply. So again, he asked, Mary, are you okay? And like the first time, no reply. So then Dennis just decides to open the door to see what's going on with her. And when he pulled back that handle and peeked his head into the bathroom, his heart immediately dropped because there he saw his 12 year old girl on the floor and looking very bad. Mary was breathing very rapidly and faint, described almost as if it looked like she was being suffocated even with nothing there. Her eyes were dilated and they were just fixed, staring in one position. When Dennis saw her, he immediately called the paramedics and he made sure he also called Gianna too. When the paramedics arrived, they started using every single thing they could possibly think to even try getting Mary in a stable state. But none of these things were working and they needed to get her to the hospital quick. So they picked Mary up 
and put her on the stretcher to start loading her into the ambulance. And while this was happening, Gianna was rushing home from work to see her daughter. She had actually arrived home just as they were loading Mary into the ambulance. But before she could get right up to her, the authorities had actually held her back, which I'm assuming must have been because things were probably looking very serious and they probably just needed to rush her to the hospital as soon as they could. They would soon leave and arrive at the Alexian Brothers Medical Center in Elk Grove Village. But by time they arrived, Mary's condition was getting worse and she had actually gone into full cardiac arrest. In the hospital, the doctors quickly installed a pacemaker in Mary's chest, but this still didn't seem to be helping and at some point, a priest was called to Mary's room because it was looking like things weren't going to be getting any better for her. And unfortunately, things didn't get any better because at 9.56am, Mary Kellerman would pass away at the age of 12. Doctors were very shocked with what happened because she was a healthy young girl who spent her free time babysitting and horseback riding and here she was dead in the hospital from apparent heart issues it looked like. But the scary thing is that this was just the start to a 24-hour nightmare which stunned the entire city of Chicago because just an hour later another person was rushed to the hospital as well and this person was 27-year-old Adam Janis. Adam was a post office supervisor and a father to a daughter Kasia and son Thomas. He was born on March 7th 1955 and was actually raised on a farm in a city called Tarnow in Poland. He and his family had had immigrated to the U.S. when he was eight years old and it was there where he would live with his wife Teresa whom he had his children with. They lived in the leafy bedroom community in Arlington Heights. Adam first moved there in the late 1970s before he met Teresa on a visit to his hometown. It was after that visit when the pair both came to the U.S. and it was in their small brick bungalow where they would continue to build their family and grow their future together. Teresa didn't speak much English but obviously Adam and her both spoke Polish so this was how they communicated. The night before, Adam was feeling a strange pain in his chest and in the morning he fortunately felt better but decided he should just take the day off work to let his body recover some more and run some errands. And so Adam, Teresa, and their son Thomas had spent the morning running the errands and shortly after he picked up his daughter from her Catholic preschool and they decided to stop at the local Jewel grocery store because he needed to pick up a few things. In the store, Adam had picked up some steaks for dinner, some fresh cut lilies for Teresa, and a a bottle of extra strength Tylenol. And when they arrived home, Adam started unpacking his bag from the grocery store. Once he finished up, he grabbed the bottle of Tylenol he purchased and he went into the bathroom so he could take some. But once he swallowed those two capsules and walked out of the bathroom, all Teresa saw was Adam clutching his chest and he was complaining that he was in pain. So he started making his way to the bedroom to presumably lay down. And Teresa, who was obviously concerned, decided to follow Adam into the bedroom. And when she walked in, Adam was breathing very rapidly and faint. His eyes were fixed and dilated. Fortunately, she noticed that just outside the window, two of her neighbors were talking and one of them actually happened to be a nurse who also spoke Polish. So she quickly ran outside and asked them for help and they all immediately ran inside to help Adam. The nurse started trying to resuscitate him while the other neighbor quickly called the paramedics. And when the medics arrived, they quickly got him into the ambulance and rushed him to the Northwest Community Hospital in Arlington Heights. He arrived there at 2.33 p.m. One of the physicians who was working to help Adam was Dr. Thomas Kim. You'll see he plays a very major role later on in figuring out some big breakthroughs in this case. Him alongside the paramedics and the other staff had been trying to revive Adam but he was not doing well and it was 3 15 p.m. just 42 minutes after arriving when Adam had passed away at the age of 27. By that point, most of Adam's immediate family were already at the hospital and Dr. Kim had to be the one who had to break the news to them that Adam had passed away. He looked fine. He seemed relatively healthy. The doctors could only assume that he must have been having heart issues, maybe a heart attack. They wouldn't have been able to know until his lab work came back. After they finished this conversation, the Janice family left the hospital to go back to Adam and Teresa's home and they were just stunned and distraught. But they needed to start figuring out their next steps and this involved planning Adam's funeral. His brother Stanley initially did not want to be there. He just wanted to go home and process what just happened. Their mother Eloisa actually had to convince him to come to Adam's. And this is where we have to take another jump in this case because just 30 minutes after Adam was pronounced dead, somebody else had been rushed to the hospital. And this person was 27-year-old Mary Lynn Ryder, who to loved ones goes by Lynn. Lynn was a mother. She had actually just given birth to her son six days 
prior, and she had three other children, two girls and one boy who were ages 9, 8, and 22 months. Lynn was born on April 15, 1955. Her and her husband, Edwin, had a home in Winfield, and it was there where they were growing their family. On that day, she was not feeling good. She had a headache, and because of this, she contacted her doctor, and she was advised that she should take some painkillers. So she went to the grocery store earlier that day to pick up a bottle of Tylenol to take two capsules. But as soon as she swallowed the capsules, she instantly started feeling unwell. Lynn collapsed on a chair in the kitchen, and it was after she collapsed when she started seizing. When Edwin saw this, he immediately called the police. And when they arrived, Lynn was having multiple seizures, one after the other. Her eyes were fixed and dilated. As she laid there seizing, her mother-in-law was actually holding her newborn baby and she was just sobbing. Her children were upstairs hearing all this happen and they were just yelling out, dad, like what's going on? And he had to just tell them just stay upstairs because he did not want them to see their mother in this state. And at 5 p.m., Lynn was rushed to the Central DuPage Hospital in Winfield and she was placed on life support. This is where we have to go back to the Janice house because it was at their house where the next victims were located. And these victims were his brother Stanley and his wife Terry. Stanley was born on April 6, 1957. He was the youngest of his four siblings and like Adam, he too grew up on a farm in Tarnow, Poland. Terry was born on June 23, 1962, growing up in Lyle, Illinois, who is a Polish heritage as well. Her name was actually Teresa also, but she liked going by Terry. She was a student at the time. She majored in business at the Illinois Benedictine College and she was the aunt to multiple nieces and nephews who adored her. They both recently got married three months prior on June 19th and they were starting a great life together. They had both just purchased a house in Lyle and they were in the process of rebuilding this home and just continuing to grow their family. After Adam had passed away, the family gathered at his house to make his funeral plans. But Stanley was not feeling good. He was feeling very uneasy after watching his brother pass away. It took his mom convincing him to actually come to Adam house for him to go. But when he did finally arrive alongside his wife Terry, his symptoms clearly didn't get any better. Being there might have actually made it worse. His back was hurting very badly and he just had this horrible headache. So Stanley started looking to see if he could find anything when he noticed the bottle of extra strength Tylenol that Adam had purchased earlier in that day. His mom too wasn't feeling good, but she had actually taken some painkillers from her purse while she was at the hospital. And he asked them, hey, like, does anyone else need any? So she shook her head no. But Terry, on the other hand, had a headache as well. So she said, yeah, like, I need some. And she grabbed a glass of water and together her and Stanley walked to the bathroom. He grabbed the bottle, poured out two capsules, swallowed it, and Terry took two capsules as well. But just like Adam earlier in that day, just a few moments went by when Stanley's chest started to hurt and he was gripping it in pain. Before he could fall, he was caught by his brother Joseph who slowly lowered him to the floor. And like Adam, his eyes were fixed and dilated and he was breathing very rapidly and faint. Before they could even process what's happening to Stanley, Terry started feeling sick as well. She too had a very bad chest pain and at this moment, a family member had started calling for an ambulance. And when they called, the paramedics actually recognized the address from earlier that day. And when they got to the house, they were witnessing the exact same symptoms of Adam, the man they just saw die earlier. As the paramedics and firefighters were approaching the home, the street was just packed with people and everyone was freaking out. When they finally got in the house, they were working diligently to try to save Stanley. This included Chuck Kramer, who was an Arlington Heights firefighter lieutenant at the time. But everyone there was scared. Even the medics were looking nervous because they knew the outcome of what had happened earlier. And this was looking like that exact moment. So while they're trying to revive Stanley, Terry, who was also in pain while frighteningly watching her unconscious husband, grabbed Chuck's shoulders for support. And she was just yelling Stanley's name. But suddenly, the yelling stopped, and Terry let out a painful groan and fell right to the floor. Her eyes were fixed and dilated, and her breathing was rapid and faint. 
By this point, there were six paramedics inside the house and they were all working on the couple. Chuck was just witnessing and he knew it wasn't just a heart attack. He told them that something was wrong. Shortly after, the paramedics loaded Stanley and Terry into separate ambulances and they were rushed to the Northwest Community Hospital. By this point, Chuck had witnessed not one, not two, but three people from the same household exhibiting the same exact symptoms just within this very short period of time. He started worrying that there may have been something wrong in that house. He was concerned that there maybe was some sort of airborne pathogen or poison infecting this family. And because of this, he had radioed for the hospital to make space for the entire family and the emergency responders to be put in a room and isolated. But just as they were being quarantined and doctors were trying to revive Stanley and Terry, just 20 miles away, somebody else had collapsed and started exhibiting the same exact symptoms. This person was 31-year-old Mary McFarland, who was often referred to as Mary Sue or Mary Mac. Mary was born in Chicago on December 7th, 1950 to parents John and Jane Elliason. She had four other siblings and they all grew up in Elmhurst. She had recently divorced two years prior in 1980, but from that marriage, she had two young sons, Ryan, who was four, and Brad, who was two. This divorce was said to be very difficult for her, but around this time, she did start dating somebody and did seem happy. And she absolutely loved her sons. They were described as being everything to her. On the night of September 29th, Mary was at work and had finished eating her dinner. She worked as a sales rep at the Illinois Bell phone store, which was located in a suburb called Lombard at the Yorktown Shopping Center. This job worked perfectly for her because with the union wages and flexible hours, she was able to arrange her schedule so that she could have the appropriate amount of time raising her kids. After her dinner break, Mary headed back to the store to continue her work. Now, the way this store was set up, it had fluorescent lights on the top of the ceiling. But these lights in particular would constantly flicker. And this was a concern not just for the employees, but for the customers. Customers oftentimes complained that the light flickering was hurting their eyes. And because of this, migraines were a common occurrence for those working in this store. So bad that the Illinois Bell actually provided a jar of painkillers for employees in the store to use. And the employees referred to these pills as greenies because they had this sort of like mossy green hue to them. On this night, Mary had developed a headache. The lights must have been flickering too much and she was not feeling good. And because of this, she headed into the break room to try to settle it down a little bit. And when she headed into the break room, she saw one of her coworkers, Deanna Hildebrand. Deanna was in the break room because she was not feeling well also. Now, Mary was not a fan of greenies. She preferred to take her own medications. So she reached into her bag and grabbed a bottle of painkillers. And these painkillers were from Tylenol. So because Deanna wasn't feeling well, Mary had asked her if she wanted some and Deanna replied to her, oh no, that's okay. I actually just took some greenies. So Mary then just grabbed two capsules for herself, swallowed them and headed back out to the store floor. It had only been a few moments later, if even 10 minutes, when Mary returned back to the break room and she just said, I'm not feeling well and suddenly collapsed. And Deanna started calling out for help, prompting several employees to rush into the room. While some tried doing CPR, the others were calling 911. And just two minutes after placing this call, the paramedics arrived and headed towards the store. When they got inside, they immediately tried reviving Mary. And when their efforts didn't work, they quickly loaded her into the ambulance and rushed her to the Good Samaritan Hospital in Downers Grove at around 7.22 p.m. While there, her family had been contacted and when they arrived, the doctors had told them that Mary had suffered from a catastrophic stroke and the doctors continued their efforts trying to revive her. But just less than an hour later, back at the Northwest Community Hospital where the Janice family were, Stanley and Terry's condition was looking very bad, especially Stanley. They were trying their best to revive him, but nothing seemed to be working. And it was just at 8.15 p.m. when Stanley would succumb to his condition and pass away at the age of 25. And sadly, this is not where the story ends because just an hour later, the seventh and final victim would experience this tragic fate. And this person was 35-year-old Paula Prince. Paula was born in Nebraska on November 21st, 1946 to parents Lord and Margaret. She was the youngest of four siblings and she was a high achiever with many goals. 
Paula lived in Chicago's Old Town neighborhood in one of the high-rise condos, and she had recently just started a party planning business with her friends. This was just one of the many endeavors Paula had because she loved to travel and was always up for an adventure. So it was very fitting for her to work as a flight attendant at United Airlines, a job she absolutely loved. With this job, Paula had made friends with another flight attendant, Jane Regula Levenhood. On this day, she had worked a return trip from Las Vegas and finished off with a trip out to Hartford, Connecticut and back. This evening, Paula had been hoping to get in contact with Jane because she had some news that she really wanted to share with her. So after her flight landed, Paula approached the flight board to check the status of Jane's flight and see when she was landing. And when she checked, she saw that Jane's flight wouldn't be landing for about another hour. So Paula decided to write a note to Jane just explaining that she went home, but that she was hoping to meet with her soon. She actually wrote, let's meet for a drink later. I have exciting news to tell you. And when she was done, she put it in Jean's airport mailbox and headed home for the night. Now, it's unclear what exactly may have been wrong, but Paula must have not been feeling well because it was on her way home when she decided to stop at a local Walgreens to pick up a bottle of Tylenol. This Walgreens was on Wall Street and was very close to her apartment building. And so she bought the $2.39 bottle of 24 capsules of extra strength Tylenol and she would shortly arrive home a few moments later. Once inside, Paula changed out of her uniform and put on a flowery nightgown to get comfortable and settle in for the night. After she was done changing, she headed up to the bathroom to finish up. While Paula was wiping the makeup off her face, she remembered that she wanted to get that Tylenol taken soon. And so she paused taking off her makeup to just quickly take this Tylenol and then continue on. So she opened up the bottle, took out a capsule, and she swallowed it at 9.30 p.m. And after taking this capsule, like many others throughout this day, Paula had started feeling very unwell and would shortly collapse. And while this was presumably the end of the first night, their nightmare was far from over because they started connecting the dots and made a very grim discovery. Just before Paula collapsed and before Stanley passed away, Fire Lieutenant Chuck Kramer was trying his absolute best to figure out what had caused three members of a family to exhibit such odd symptoms. So he decided to get in contact with somebody he knew would have more expertise in getting this figured out. It only made sense to him that they needed a public health expert. And this was when he got into contact with Helen Jensen, his friend who was the Arlington Heights Village nurse. Helen was the town's only public health official, so she had many roles in serving the community. On this evening, Helen had finished up her day at work. At the time, she was preparing dinner for her family when she started to hear the phone ring. So she picked up the phone and she said, hello, like, who's this? Who she heard on the other line was Chuck. Chuck had grabbed the phone in the hospital to call Helen as soon as he could. And when she answered, he would explain, Helen, look, there had been three young, healthy individuals. They're all from the same family and they all got super sick suddenly. Two of them passed away. We don't know what's wrong. We really need your help. Helen was quite literally in her house clothes and she was cooking dinner for her family, but she dropped whatever she was doing and she immediately headed towards the hospital. It had only been 15 minutes after they ended their call when Helen arrived at the hospital. And when she did, she walked straight into the room that the Janice family was quarantined in. Didn't talk to the staff, didn't talk to the doctors, just straight into the quarantine room. Of the family members who were in quarantine included Teresa, Adam's widow. In the room, she was in the corner standing all by herself and she was just looking confused and dazed. But she was also the first person Helen wanted to speak to. So Helen asked if it'd be okay if they talk and Teresa agreed and a family member came over to help translate. Teresa began by explaining what had happened throughout the day. She would tell Helen how they'd woken up and ran some errands before Adam suddenly fell ill. But what Helen noticed was that in every recount, Teresa had mentioned that each of them had taken Tylenol. And this was the moment Helen said, can I get a key to your house? Because Helen wanted to go over there and take a look at that Tylenol bottle. It was around 8 p.m. when Helen headed inside the house and started looking for anything that could have possibly been related to this mystery illness. This included a pot of black coffee with used coffee grounds, a pound cake, homemade jarred fruits, cherry juice, prescription meds, and even the flowers that Adam had purchased for Teresa earlier in that day. So most of these items seemed to come from the kitchen, which would have been an area that many people would have been in contact with. 
But when she made her way to the bathroom, she found the one thing that she was mainly looking for, and this was the bottle of extra strength Tylenol. When she saw it, the first thing she did was open it up and pour all the capsules out because she wanted to make sure that the right amount of capsules was inside that bottle. She actually counted these capsules multiple times and each time she would count that there were 44 capsules in the 50 count bottle. And when doing the math, there were three individuals, they all took two capsules each, three times two is six, 50 minus six is 44. So there was in fact the correct amount of capsules in there. By that point, she was all done, tidied up, and exited the home and headed back to the hospital. And when she got there, she immediately approached a Cook County medical examiner representative who was in a conference room, and the first thing she did was take out that bottle and place it on the table. And she told them, it has to be the Tylenol. But nobody believed her. So again, she sternly said, listen to me, there's something in that Tylenol. And she was met with the same response. They thought her speculation was ridiculous. And because they ruled this out, Helen was left to just go home. She had actually cried herself to sleep that night because she felt as though had she not been a nurse and had she not been a woman, they would have taken her much more seriously. And many more lives wouldn't be in harm's way. Especially because it would only be a couple hours later when the hospital started putting pieces together and realized Helen might have actually been right. Back at the Northwest Community Hospital, Dr. Kim informed Chuck that Stanley had passed away and he began telling him what he thought truly happened to this family because Dr. Kim now believed that this situation had nothing to do with an environmental toxin, but rather that this family must have ingested something so bad that it was causing them to get ill and shortly pass away. So the first responders who were quarantined were released from the hospital and they were told just to be on the safe side to decontaminate at their home stations. And the Janice family was taken out of quarantine as well, but they were admitted into the hospital that night for further observation, just to make sure that if it was something they ingested, that nobody would get sick from it hours later. But reasonably, nobody felt safe. Adam and Stanley's siblings, Joseph and Sophia, were terrified that night. They spent the entire night looking at each other, just making sure none of them suddenly got sick and passed away. And family members who weren't in the hospital were especially scared too. Joseph's wife, Elizabeth, had taken her children into a bedroom and told them to just pray as hard as they absolutely could. She even called her family back in Poland and requested that they go to a nearby religious site called a Czestochowa, as this was a place where Catholics often asked for miracles. Around this time, Lieutenant Chuck was on his way to the firehouse alongside his crew. And while on his way, he decided to radio the emergency dispatchers and just tell them, hey, like, my truck is out of commission for now. I'll let you guys know when it's back in use. And he arrived at the station shortly after. Only a few minutes after arriving at the station, he noticed his phone started to ring. And when he answered the call, he was met by a close friend of his, Phil Capitelli. Phil was another fire lieutenant at Arlington Heights. He had just heard Chuck's radio message that the entire station would be shut down. And he was just asking like, hey, like what happened? Why is the station shut down? So Chuck started recalling the conversation that Helen had with Adam's widow, Teresa. He was explaining how this family was getting sick out of nowhere with this mystery illness. And Phil was just listening to this and thinking that that was obviously odd. But it was when Chuck had said that the only thing the family had in common was the fact that all of them had taken Tylenol, this was when a light bulb clicked in Phil's head. Because Phil had in fact heard about 12-year-old Mary Kellerman's passing earlier in that day. His mother-in-law actually happened to work with Mary's mother at United Airlines. So that morning when Mary fell ill and her mom rushed home from work, his mother-in-law was there when this was happening and she told this to Phil. And after she told Phil about this, he wanted to find out more about the situation. These days, we have something called the Healthcare Privacy Law, or HIPAA. But this didn't come out until 1996. So he called another firefighter, Richard Keyworth, and he asked him like, hey, what happened earlier today with the 12-year-old girl, Mary? And Richard had informed him about what he knew about the situation, which was that Mary was a perfectly healthy seventh grader who had just got a cold and happened to take some Tylenol. So at this point, Phil stopped Chuck and he asked, wait, they all took Tylenol? And Chuck was like, yeah, that, that was it. They, each of them took Tylenol. This was when Phil had told him that earlier in that day, a 12-year-old girl had also collapsed and passed away after taking Tylenol too. 
And at this exact moment, Chuck was just hit with the biggest realization because this was when he realized this wasn't a mystery illness. This wasn't the environment. There was somebody deliberately poisoning these people with Tylenol. So after they ended this call, Chuck quickly called the fire department in Elk Grove, where Mary was from, and he got in contact with one of the paramedics who had treated Mary. He just needed to know three things. Were Mary's eyes fixed and dilated? Was her breathing faint and rapid? And did her symptoms lack response to any medical interventions? The paramedic would answer yes for all three of those questions. Chuck now knew he needed to call the hospital and he told them everything that Helen had already told them that there's something wrong with the Tylenol. Now, Dr. Kim had already been informed about the connection with Tylenol, but from previous cases he's dealt with, he knew what acetaminophen poisoning looked like. And this wasn't that. Just to clarify, the drug inside of Tylenol is acetaminophen. Symptoms of acetaminophen poisoning are said to develop in four stages, which could span over the course of several days. And this typically starts with vomiting in stage one, which can progress to vomiting with nausea and abdominal pain in stage two, poor liver function in stage three, and organ failure in stage four. Not suddenly collapsing and suffering cardiac arrest. So Dr. Kim started thinking, yeah, it could be the Tylenol, but there must be something in the Tylenol causing this illness. This was when he began contacting several poisoning experts, and he was going through his old textbooks from medical school to see if he could find any substance that would typically cause people to exhibit such symptoms. He was pacing back and forth in his office, and he was ruling out anything that seemed to not make sense. And in the end, he came up with something that he thought could only be the possible cause of these symptoms. And this was the substance cyanide, a chemical that when ingested works quickly and can be lethal. Cyanide is a fast-acting poison which causes oxygen supply to be cut off from the red blood cells. This substance is very toxic to humans and should not be ingested. In fact, it's linked to being used as a chemical warfare agent dating back to 37 to 68 CE. This was the only thing that Dr. Kim thought could have possibly caused these deaths. And because this hospital couldn't test for cyanide at the time, he contacted a nearby 24-hour lab in Highland Park to see if they could run some tests. And because they were able to do so, he then grabbed two vials, placed Stanley's blood in one and Terry's blood in the other, and then he called a cab to pick it up to bring to the lab. As the taxi driver was pulling out, Dr. Kim was actually nervous that his colleagues would see any of Janice's family's charts and think that he was foolish. Because to everyone, it seemed like such a wild thought that there could have been cyanide or even anything in the Tylenol. But while this was happening, a police officer from Elk Grove Village brought the Tylenol bottle from Mary Kellerman's home to the hospital. And when he did this, he brought the bottle to a Cook County medical examiner investigator, Nicholas Pichos. Now, when Nicholas was brought this bottle, he actually already had the bottle that Helen had brought to the hospital earlier. And when he looked at the bottles, he noticed that both of them had the same lot number. So Nicholas called his boss, Dr. Edmund Donahue, who was the Cook County's deputy chief medical examiner. And Dr. Donahue told him to open one of the bottles to see how it smelled. So he opened the bottle and he poured out the capsules and he just had the strongest whiff of this bitter almond-like scent. And when he opened the second bottle, it smelled the exact same. And you know what the interesting part about that is? Cyanide is often described as having a bitter almond-like odor. It was at this point Dr. Donahue's suspicions were confirmed. He knew that inside those Tylenol bottles was cyanide. Only about 60% of the population are able to detect this bitter almond-like odor from cyanide, and Nicholas just happened to be one of them. So after this, Dr. Donahue immediately called the county's chief toxicologist, Michael Schaefer, and he asked Michael if he could come to the morgue to run some tests on the Tylenol capsules. This was the first time he's ever had to call toxicology to work on an overnight case, because nothing like this has ever happened in the history of these hospitals. So, of course, Michael came over and he started running some tests, and when the results came, a lot of people's suspicions were confirmed because the test would show that of the 44 remaining capsules in the Tylenol bottle from the Janice family home, there were a total of four capsules that contained cyanide. In fact, each of the capsules there had 550 to 610 milligrams of cyanide. That's nearly three times the lethal dose of this poison. 
and all seven of these victims must have ingested just around that amount. And just a few hours later, at around 1.30 in the morning, Dr. Kim, who had just sent the vials of Stanley and Terry's blood to the lab, had received a call back from a technician there. And this technician told him, hey, like, we found that there was indeed cyanide in the blood. In fact, there were massive amounts of it. And she went on to tell him, like, hey, I've never ran a cyanide test before, but I did, in fact, follow the correct screening protocols, and there's just way too much cyanide in their blood. So Dr. Kim then asked her if he could have the phone number for the lab director so that he would be able to call and talk more in depth about the results. But the technician was feeling pretty hesitant to give him the number. It was only after he gave her the ultimatum, you can either give me his number so I can talk to him or you can give it to the police when I send them to the lab when she gave him the number. And on this phone call with the director who had just gotten woken up from this call, he would assure Dr. Kim that this technician was one of his best and he was was confident that the test was run correctly. There was a massive amount of cyanide in their blood, and it wasn't too long after this when news would break everywhere. News stations were posting bulletins, radios were going live. At the same time, back at the Good Samaritan Hospital in Downers Grove, Mary McFarland was not looking too good. And it was at 3.18 a.m. that early morning of September 30th when she passed away at the age of 31. Just a few hours went by at around 5.30 a.m. when Helen, who was the initial one saying that it was the Tylenol, was asleep at her home while her husband was getting ready for work. And he had on the local radio station that he always listened to in the mornings. At this time, no news stations had reported that it was Tylenol that caused these deaths, but City News did report that the medical examiner's office had attributed the three deaths to an unnamed headache remedy and that they would be holding a news conference just a few hours later. So the radio station he was listening to had brought this up and mentioned that there was this unnamed headache remedy causing these deaths. So at this moment, he went to their room and he woke up Helen and he told her, you were right, it's on the radio, it was the Tylenol. And a few hours later, when the news would finally confirm to the public that it was indeed Tylenol, the pharmaceutical company Johnson & Johnson, who was the parent company of Tylenol, had decided to recall 93,000 bottles from this batch linked to Mary Kellerman and the Janice's deaths. And then they later expanded to recall another 171,000 bottles from the same lot number that Mary McFarlane had purchased. Stores began pulling any Tylenol packages that they had off of their shelves. Public health departments were also going door to door, handing out flyers and warning people to be cautious of these potentially poisonous capsules in their homes. And police officers were even driving through the streets using bullhorns to tell people to get rid of their Tylenol. It was, however, also on this day when tragedy would strike for the last few victims. Things were not looking like they were going to be getting any better for Mary Lynn Reiner at the Central DuPage Hospital. Hospital. And so at 9.05 a.m., she was taken off of life support and passed away at the age of 27. And on the next day, on October 1st, back at the Northwest Community Hospital at 1.15 p.m., Terry would succumb to this poisoning and pass away at the age of 20. And later that evening, the lifeless body of Paula Prince, who had taken the Tylenol after getting off of work as a flight attendant, was discovered in her high-rise apartment and she was pronounced dead at 6.45 p.m. And do you remember how Paula had left a note for her friend Jean asking to meet later on because she had exciting news to tell her? Well, it turns out that at Paula's funeral, Jean found out what the exciting news was about. And it was that Paula had met a man during a recent layover in Las Vegas, and they were seriously in love. In fact, they had planned on getting married soon. On that day of October 1st, investigators were diligently looking into figuring out what happened in this case. And on October 2nd, the Chicago mayor, Jane Bryan, had announced to the public the seventh death of this poisoning, Paula Prince. Additionally, she also banned the sale and distribution of all Tylenol products in the city. One of the crucial discoveries investigators made was that each of the tainted bottles they discovered were manufactured in either Pennsylvania or Texas. So they thought that somebody must have tainted them after they were already on the store shelves in Chicago, and that this person ride the capsules open and then once done, filling it with cyanide, placed them back together and put them in the bottle. And because there was clearly somebody who did this, John Johnson & Johnson was offering $100,000 as a reward to anyone who had any information on something that could lead to a conviction. 
Just a couple days later, on the 4th, Johnson & Johnson stopped creating the capsule form of extra-strength Tylenol. The FDA had also tested over 1 million other capsules and fortunately found that there was no more poisoning outside of Chicago. And just the next day on the 5th, Johnson & Johnson just flat out recalled every single bottle they had of Tylenol. This was the first majorly known mass recall in U.S. history, as it involved more than 31 million bottles and costed the company over $100 million which is the equivalent to about $300 million today. And they urged stores from all around the country to take any kind of Tylenol bottle off of their shelves. And just the following day on October 6th, they received a tip that would soon change this investigation because this was the day they received a letter from somebody claiming that they were the one who tainted the capsules. It was in this letter this person wrote, if you want to stop the killing, wire a million dollars to said bank account. In fact, this same person also sent a letter to the then president, Ronald Reagan, saying, I will seize these killings if you will not let the taxes increase. Your prompt consideration may save the lives of many. Once this first letter had arrived to Johnson & Johnson, Tylenol's manufacturer, McNeil Pharmaceuticals, immediately contacted the FBI about it. And on that same day, they got somewhat of another break because somebody had put in a tip of a possible suspect. And this suspect was Roger Arnold. Roger was a dock hand at a jewel warehouse. He had previously served in the military and enjoyed chemistry as a hobby. He was a semi-regular at a Chicago tavern on Lincoln Avenue called the Oxford Pub. The owner of this tavern, Marty Sinclair, had always gotten weird vibes from Roger, but he especially thought that Roger's behavior was a bit erratic around this time because he actually just divorced a few months earlier in the summer. It was when Marty and other bartenders had heard from other patrons that Roger had a project he was working on in his home, which involved the use of cyanide, when he decided to call the police and put in a report. He was concerned because this apparent project involved the use of two 16-ounce bottles of cyanide, which Roger had purchased six months prior. And it was finally on October 11th, five days after this tip, at around 7 p.m. when they picked up Roger and brought him to their headquarters for questioning. This is when he told them that he did in fact purchase the cyanide. However, he said that he had gotten rid of them before the poisonings occurred. So of course, the detectives requested to search his home and when he approved, they went over to see if they would find anything in his house. They actually found no cyanide at all. However, they did find several unlicensed handguns and a rifle. And additionally, they found a bunch of chemistry related items including a bag of white powder, several beakers, vials, funnels, test tubes, and even a catalog from a lab company with a bunch of different chemicals circled. In fact, they even found something called the poor man's James Bond. And this is a book with instructions on how to make potassium cyanide. In the poor man's James Bond, it actually included suggestions of putting cyanide in capsules contained in an enemy's medicine cabinet. And in fact, they even found that Roger had a one-way ticket to Thailand, which was planned to depart just four days later on October 15th. So it almost looked like he had an escape plan if he got caught. But the detectives actually later learned that he frequently traveled there for R-rated activities. And because all the evidence they got on him was just circumstantial, they weren't able to use this as evidence to link him to the poisonings. In fact, even the white powder in his home was later identified as potassium carbonate and not cyanide. The only way they'd be able to convict him is if they got a confession. But when they went to the room Roger was in to try interrogating him, he was demanding to get an attorney. And this was all because while the detectives were arranging their evidence, some of the police department superiors went into the room and began questioning Roger. And word of what the detectives had found in his home began to quickly spread in the station. So by the time they tried conducting their interrogation, Roger knew they were on to him and refused to proceed forward without an attorney present. So instead, police arrested him on failure to register his firearms, which were misdemeanors. And because these charges weren't too serious, they weren't able to hold him for any longer. But just two days later on October 13th, they made some substantial progress because the Tylenol task force was able to identify the person who wrote the extortion letter the week prior. And they publicly identified this man as Robert Richardson. However, when the Kansas City Police Sergeant David Barton saw his picture, he immediately knew who it was. And it wasn't a Robert Richardson, but was rather a man named James Lewis. 
James was supposedly a tax accountant. I'll explain this in a second. He seemed to not have an official job, but what he most certainly was was no stranger to crime. Just four years earlier, in 1978, he was actually charged with the dismemberment murder of 72-year-old Raymond West. But these charges were later dismissed as they weren't able to determine his cause of death. And apparently, some of the evidence had been illegally obtained by police, so they had to rule this out on technicality issues. Actually, even 12 years before that, in 1966, James had committed a very violent act. He had allegedly attacked his adoptive mother with an axe. But nothing came of this as he voluntarily admitted himself into a mental hospital and the attack was considered done by reason of insanity. But just three years after the Raymond West case in December 1981, he was caught in a credit card scheme and was convicted of six counts of mail fraud in Kansas City. James had apparently been using one of his previous clients' names and background to obtain 13 credit cards. It was when he was caught in Kansas City City when he and his wife Leanne had fled to Chicago under the aliases Robert and Nancy Richardson. Police had actually described James as a chameleon as he lived in several different states and used at least 20 different aliases to do work in different jobs. This included working as a computer specialist, a tax consultant, and he even imported Indian tapestries, did jewelry sales, worked pharmaceutical machinery, and did real estate. So this man clearly wasn't the most shocking suspect to commit a crime like this. And Sergeant Barton immediately called the FBI to notify them like hey like his name is James Lewis and just after that he was on a flight to Chicago the next morning to meet with the task force to provide insight on James Lewis. At this meeting he told them all about James' his criminal history and the task force made sure to update his true identity with the public. At this point there was a massive manhunt for James Lewis. In fact while this manhunt was happening James was sending letters to the Chicago Tribune denying any involvement in the crimes and instead saying that he sent the extortion letters because he wanted to draw attention to his wife's boss Frederick Miller McKayhee. Him and Leanne had a problem with Frederick because apparently in December 1981, when she was working at his agency, the final paycheck she received from him bounced. And after this, she filed a complaint with the Illinois Labor Wage Claim Board, and James wrote a three-page document about this claim, offering to speak about it on behalf of the employees. And at a wage board hearing, he was told he had no place speaking on it since he wasn't an employee there himself. In the end, the judge denied the employees' claims, and before leaving the court, James got into a heated shouting match with Frederick before he left. So while there's this massive manhunt out convicting him of these heinous crimes, he thought it was instead important to send the Chicago Tribune letters about Frederick's business practices. And he mailed his first of three letters to them on October 27th. James was finally caught and arrested by the FBI on December 13th, 1982 at a New York City library. And they returned him to Chicago two weeks later on the 28th in a military plane. Leanne turned herself in the other day, but the misdemeanor charges on her for allegedly using a fake social security number were later dropped. James pleaded not guilty to his fraud charges, but he was convicted and found guilty of mail fraud in relation to his 1981 credit card scam. And on May 26, 1983, he was sent to 10 years in federal prison relating to this scam. Not even a month later, there would actually be an eighth and final victim of these Tylenol poisonings. Because on June 18th, Roger Arnold decided that he wanted revenge on whoever told the detectives that he may be a suspect. He wanted to inflict harm on this bartender who reported him. This was when he fatally shot 46-year-old John Stanasia at a local bar. John was the father of three girls. He was a computer programmer and was said to have a passion for folk music. On that summer day, Roger had shot him and he passed away. But it turns out that John, in fact, was not the bartender who had reported him to the police, but that this rather was a man he did not know. Roger would later admit that this was a case of mistaken identity and that he meant to get the man who had reported him. And on January 11th, 1984, he was sentenced to 30 years in prison, being alleged for parole after serving half of the term. 
As for James Lewis, he was convicted of attempted extortion for his letters and was sentenced to 10 years in federal prison to be served after his time served for his mail fraud case. They found he was not guilty of actually committing the poisonings as there was no way to prove that he did it, although he always remained a prime suspect. What's interesting is that while James was awaiting his sentencing, he was offering his help to investigators to try solving the Tylenol murder. In fact, he provided detailed drawings showing how one might have tampered with the bottles. He was doing this all the while maintaining his innocence. And after 13 years served in prison, James was released on October 13th, 1995. They were now staying in Boston and James had started working on a web design business and writing a novel. And in 1998, Roger Arnold was released from prison. He moved back to the south side of Chicago where he found a job at an auto supply store and he became very close with his co-workers, described almost like a surrogate family. But the crimes just honestly didn't seem to stop because it would be later when James Lewis was convicted of kidnapping and being a former business partner at his apartment in 2004. These charges were later dropped though in 2007 when his former business partner declined to testify against him. The following year on June 16, 2008, Roger Arnold passed away at 73 and his body was later exhumed on June 30th, 2010 so authorities couldn't conduct DNA testing. That didn't come up with anything. And just between those years, up until July 6, 2023, when James Lewis had passed away at 76, he had been subject to many investigations as well. This included a taped conversation at a hotel on September 21st, 2022, but nothing came of that as well. So as of today, there are no suspects to have ever been charged with committing the Tylenol murders, and this crime unfortunately remains unsolved. Though many people still believe that James is the one who allegedly did this. So how does this all relate to Halloween? Apparently before this case even happened, fear of contaminated candy was already a thing. However, these poisonings really heightened the fear of what felt like an epidemic of people tainting children's candies. And this is called Halloween sadism. Being that this initial investigation for the Tylenol murders was in October during Halloween season, people were terrified that these poisonings would be carried out in their children's candies later that month. No suspect had been caught yet. And if this suspect was still out and they're willing to put cyanide in Tylenol capsules, Who's to say that they wouldn't do the same in Halloween candy? And there wasn't just fear of cyanide, but people were actually worried of somebody putting possibly other items in their candy as well. For decades, there had been scary Halloween tales of children's candy being supposedly spiked with razors and rat poison. Dr. Joel Best, a sociology and criminal justice professor at the University of Delaware, who was also a leading expert on Halloween sadism, traced this phenomenon back to the beginning of organized trick-or-treating, which was in the 1950s. And in the late 1960s, early 1970s, reports of Halloween sadism really began to take off. On October 28th, 1970, the New York Times had published an article warning people about razor blades being put in apples, chocolate bars being replaced with laxatives, and sleeping pills being placed in candy packets. Apparently, this was because the New York State Health Commissioner had cautioned people saying that in recent years, pins, razor blades, silvers of glass, and poison have appeared in the treats gathered by children across New York State. And a psychiatrist, Dr. Reginald Steen, attributed these tamperings with what he called the permissiveness of society resulting in people getting away with more and more violence. People supposedly were thinking that if they poisoned candies, nothing would happen to them. The fear of this happening was really strong, especially in Chicago, but it did span to several different cities as well. Bob Green, a columnist for the Chicago Tribune, wrote, if you are a parent and you have any sense, you will forbid your child from going out trick-or-treating this Halloween. In this year of the Tylenol killer, it would be especially foolish to let a boy or girl go door to door asking for food. And so Chicago did take that hint and they gave no candy out that year. In fact, the mayor had encouraged people to instead of giving out treats or food to just give out things that weren't edible. They distributed over 1 million leaflets, encouraging residents to instead give out money or small toys. Some areas had even asked that their residents give out redeemable coupons so that children could just get the candy from the stores. But some cities just flat out canceled Halloween altogether. 
together. Places like Violin, New Jersey fully canceled their trick-or-treating, and multiple other suburbs did the same as well in states such as Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Massachusetts. Stores around the country even reported having a 20% decrease in candy sales around this time. However, despite the strong fear of contaminated candy, reports of Halloween sadism was actually considered to be hoaxes as opposed to actual occurrences. In 1985, expert Dr. Best published The Razor Blade in the Apple, a research paper investigating all known claims of Halloween sadism dating back to 1958. He found that in that fall of 1982, there were 12 reported cases of Halloween sadism. But even with all of these reports, he concluded that he was unable to find a substantiated report of a child being killed or seriously injured by a contaminated treat picked up in the course of trick-or-treating, saying that all of those claims of people putting razor blades or pins or ant poisons in candy were really just hoaxes that adults or even kids just made up. Whenever someone cited an incident where a child passed away on Halloween, they attributed the passing to tainted candy. However, it was found that in most scenarios where a child did pass away on Halloween, medical records confirmed that it was rather the result of infections, heart defects, or any other explainable illnesses. There had only been one confirmed case of a child being poisoned and passing away from their Halloween candy. And this child was eight-year-old Timothy O'Brien. Timothy had passed away on Halloween night in 1974 after ingesting candy that was laced with cyanide. The unique thing about this case, though, was that the killer wasn't a neighbor handing out candy on Halloween night, but was rather his father, Ronald Clark O'Brien. Ronald had poisoned Timothy in an attempt to cash in on an insurance policy. He was ultimately convicted and sentenced to death because of this crime. So, linking Halloween candy to poisoning from neighbors or strangers really was never an actual thing. What was true, however, was that there was heightened cases of people being poisoned in general after the Tylenol murders occurred. These cases were called copycat crimes, where people were lacing things like medication capsules with lethal substances. On October 13, 1983, the U.S. Congress passed what was called the Tylenol Bill, this bill making it a federal offense to tamper with consumer products with a maximum sentence of life in prison. This didn't stop these crimes from continuing, though, as there were still cases of Tylenol supposedly being tainted with cyanide. On February 8, 1986, 23-year-old Diane Ellsroth had passed away in Peekskill, New York from what was believed a cyanide-laced Tylenol because they did confirm that her cause of death was cyanide poisoning. And this was when New York banned the sale of Tylenol products and other states followed right after. In fact, the FDA issued a nationwide alert prohibiting the use of any Tylenol products. Authorities were calling for bans of any non-prescription medication in capsule form, as whoever was tainting them was able to do so by opening up and closing the capsule. This was when Johnson & Johnson just fully ended their production of any medication in capsule form. But these crimes still continued just with other medications. There were cases like Stella Nichol, who in 1986 tainted Excedrin with cyanide, causing two people to pass away in the Seattle area. One of these two people included her husband, Bruce Nichol, and a woman named Sue Snow. She was sentenced to two concurrent terms in 90 years and will be eligible for release in 2040, when she's 96. None of these copycat crimes were considered as dramatic or as deadly as the Chicago Tylenol murders in 1982. And some of this must have been mitigated as Johnson & Johnson introduced their first shipment of tamper-resistant Tylenol packages to stores on December 6, 1986. In fact, on February 2, 1989, the FDA had established federal guidelines for manufacturers stating that any such over-the-counter medication product must be tamper-proof. And Congress passed federal legislation requiring tamper-evident packaging for any sale of these products. This is why every over-the-counter medication you find today is now equipped with a safety seal. And this is also why you notice that a lot of the over-the-counter medications you buy aren't in capsule form. Most of them are now in tablets, so nobody would be able to break them in half, put something inside, and put them back up. With the case still being unsolved, the victim's loved ones would unfortunately till this day be left with questions on who had done this. Actually, on May 13, 1991, the families of the seven poisoning victims reached a settlement with Johnson & Johnson, with the deal being that the amount they got would remain undisclosed and that the company can admit to no wrongdoing. But still, no amount of money would change what any of these people went through and continue to go through as they await justice.
But that is it for this case. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know what your thoughts are on this story and please consider subscribing so you don't miss any other videos involving medical cases, crime, and mysteries. Bye now.